Guitar practice session 10824. These are fairly sloppy practice sessions where I try to practice whatever I think I need to be working on, hoping the practice sessions help to generate a routine, verbalize what I'm trying to learn to get it in my mind better, possibly provide information to others, working on similar items, possibly also providing for feedback if anybody sees a better way to do the things that I'm trying to do to learn the things I'm trying to learn. Practice session might be a little bit different than other things that you might see in that we have our Excel worksheet that we will be working with, trying to orientate everything. So it's as easy to visualize the shapes on the fretboard as possible from the perspective of playing the guitar from behind the guitar where we have the top or heavy string on top. And if we implanted the guitar onto the screen, we end up with this being the top or heavy string top to bottom, left to right from the same perspective as you behind the guitar. I will also rotate my guitar so it looks like I'm left-handed so that once again, what I am playing, you can kind of visualize your own fingers on it, even though it would be your, your, you know, your left hand. And we'll try to put it somewhat close to the frets that we will be working on so you can kind of line everything up as we visualize the different shapes on the fretboard. We're going to be working once again on what I would call shape number four, looking on mode number one, the Ionian mode or uh, the major scale. Remembering that the major scale is going to be really important because we're going to use that as our Rosetta Stone, as our benchmark to compare everything else to. And as with a Rosetta Stone, there's no one language that really uh, is the key language that everything else is based off of oftentimes. It's just that that's the thing that we often know best. And in Western music, we often orientate around the uh, major scale. So what I would like, what we're going to work on then doing is basically looking at the relative positions for the major scale, give an absolute numbering system for the modes so that when I go to a different mode, I have an idea of the same absolute numbering system for the mode, which helps us to orientate ourselves on the fretboard, not by note number or note name, but rather by shape and mode number or mode name which will make it easier for, for us to basically orientate ourselves even as we move from the Ionian mode to the Dorian mode to the Phrygian mode because everything on the fretboard moves in, in conjunction with each other as uh, because all the shapes are basically movable shapes. So my goal is to try to memorize everything or look at everything from the perspective of it being as maneuverable as possible so that we can go from mode to mode. So we then go into each of these shapes and we basically analyze them, breaking out what I would think of as the five string guitar plus an added E string, right? Five string plus another E. Uh, we can break it out into the three note, two note, what I would call the pentatonic shape, the hamburger barbell shape, or we can break it out into what I would call the seven note shape of the house analogy shape. So we'll take a look at those. Uh, but then before we go into this shape, we actually jump back and spend a bit more time on what I call the three note per string shape. And we analyze this one a bit more, just looking at the pros and cons of it, this time concentrating on the fact that with this shape, you basically have six, if you're looking at the key of C, you have six of the seven notes that are in uh, the top two strings, which is a useful way to visualize it because oftentimes when we build bar chords, then we want to we want to have the top two strings to build them off of. So we kind of it's so we look at this shape comparing it to the related shape number two in our our normal five shape breakout so that we can see and try to reconcile the differences between them, how we can use them together and look at one of the main pros or a good big pro of the three note per string shape, which is the fact that Again, the, the, the top two strings are going to have almost the entire scale, the ones that we want to build our chords from. And then we'll talk a little bit more about how to build chords, the three note pentatonic chords off of each of these shapes by using our, our information over here of modes and uh, whether we have a major or minor chord that will be constructed. We'll then talk about using the same idea, but then building what I call a lean back shape or from the top notes, it would be like a G shape. And on the second note, a lean back shape, which would be like a C shape from a caged system. 
and noting that I could still take these baseline notes and build them with a, a three note chord, either what I call lean forward, which are bar shapes typically, what most people see them as, and then what I would call lean back shapes, which would be on the top string like a G shape, on the second string like a C shape. And then also when we go down below, we also note that we can then go above it, right? So then I, I also look a little bit about, well, what if this was the one I'm, wor I'm working on above it? I have the fifth and then I can add the third below it. So I'm just trying to see how we can convert each of these notes into a shape, uh, which is another exercise I should probably spend a little bit more time on, which is, which is interesting. So then we take that concept of the lean back shapes and talk a little bit about building our chord with the lean back shapes, taking basically a G lean back shape, making a C chord with like a G shape, and then the D minor lean back shape and combining those together, which gives us our scale, which is another way to see the scales in what I would call a two note per string uh, scale shape and see how we can integrate that idea into what we did with the three note per string scale shape and the lean back shapes being integrated, which can also be thought of as basically a two note per string scale shape. Then we go back to the C and finally we're going to go through our intervals. I do a little joke here, which has a little bit of politics in it. So hopefully if you get offended by politics, you can skip that. Uh, American politics, uh, if you don't know, if you're not in America, you might not know what you're talking about. And that's cool too. You can skip it or whatever. But then we're going to go into here and I go from the bottom C around the horn to this C and we compare all of the intervals as we go through there count through the intervals as we go through there and then try to get an idea of the where each of these modes live in our two analogies the house analogy seven note house analogy and the hamburger barbell five note pentatonic uh analogy and then we also as we do that think through the the uh pentatonic shape five note versus seven notes which notes would be removed and then we go from there to the one spot so we we've been looking at this in the last few times looking at looking at the related modes in the key of c so we're i mean the key of a so we look at the major and then we compare that to the related major modes which only have one distinct interval when compared to the major mode lydian and then the mixolydian and I'm spending a little bit more time today thinking about like uh, the three ways I can define these different shapes. So this is what I would call, you know, shape number two. I can figure out my scale by knowing just the shape on the guitar. I can figure it out by mapping out the intervals, which will build the shape on the guitar. Or I can figure it out by knowing my whole step, half step formula, which goes from one note to the next note. And I'm trying to work on different ways that we can kind of memorize each of those three ways to, to know the shapes because they all have their kind of pros and cons and are once again integrated as well as the idea that the shapes are defined a lot by these half steps that are in the box, which we can determine that's actually one of the defining factors between going from a seven note to a five note pentatonic. So I can actually locate this Lydian and the Locrian mode and those are always where the whole steps and half steps will be no matter what mode we are in. So if I'm looking at the absolute mode system, I can look for Lydian and Locrian and say when I go out from Locrian to the next one, and this one's seven to eight, I'd have a half step and going into the Lydian, I have a half step in this case from three to four. And then if I go to the Phrygian, I can do the same thing and say, well, here's my Lydian going into Lydian. That would mean from one to two in the Phrygian and the Locrian here going out of the Locrian from five to six, because in terms of absolute modes or an absolute numbering system, going from going from like five to six would be the same as going from seven to eight to the relative major. So I start to kind of get into that until my head kind of goes goes on me. And then so I compare the majors to the majors and then we take a look at the minors here and we map out the minor, which is like shape number one and compare that to the minor modes, which are of course the Dorian, which has a distinctive uh, minor seven, and then the Phrygian, which has the distinctive uh, minor second, and uh, that's basically it.
Continuing on with what I would call shape number four, looking at what I would call mode number one, the Ionian mode, otherwise known as the major scale. Remembering that we're going to be using absolute mode numbers that are based on the Ionian mode or major scale as we move through all of the different modes, which makes the major scale vitally important for us to understand because that's our key, that's our Rosetta Stone, that's where we go when we don't know where we are when we're trying to look from different perspectives, different languages in this analogy as we go through the different modes. So with the major scale or the Ionian mode, you can see on the left hand side, we have what we call the relative positions, the seven notes out of the 12 notes. I'm gonna be labeling the mode names with those same numbering systems, although I'm gonna be using the Roman numerals and we'll have the uppercase Roman numerals when we build a major chord off it and a lowercase when we build a minor chord off it. That's a normal convention that is often used with regards to the relative positions because that helps us to see what kind of chords we would build when thinking about only three note triad chords. However, it would be a step further for us to actually memorize the related modes because the related modes tell us not only whether the third is gonna be major or minor, but also whether it's gonna have what kind of seventh, what kind of uh, ninth, what kind of 11th that it's going to have. So that's why that's gonna be uh, really important. And what I mean by keeping the mode numbers the same is that if we then went to the Dorian mode, notice what happens in the Dorian mode. All of the notes are the same over here, but they're in a different order based on what I call the relative positions, the first through the sevenths. And now we can see the mode ordering has basically changed now as well. But instead of me renaming the Dorian as mode number one, I'm gonna keep the absolute mode number as the second mode. So when I say it's the second mode, I'm saying it's the second mode relative to our Rosetta Stone, our base point, our, our major scale. I'm not saying C major, any major, that would be the same. So if we learn the relative positions, then we can more easily kind of move around the fretboard through the different modes and hopefully be able to orientate ourselves. So in order to do that, uh, to make that as practical as possible, what we need to learn is the, the one through seven positions, not really the note names per se, or that, that would be cool to learn, but we're always working mainly here in the key of C. I'm then gonna go to the key of G possibly because that's the second most possibly used major and then related modes uh, later. And that could be useful to do, but what we really wanna do is memorize where the relative positions are on the fretboard so that we can see it kind of like as an accountant, I see it as a, a spreadsheet so that I can basically just shift those up like copying and pasting cells on a spreadsheet and the shapes are all the same. That's what we wanna learn because that's what's movable. So that's what, so then I want to basically be able to name in our shape over here where all of the relative, where all the modes are. It doesn't really help me so much to, to be able to name where all the, the one through seven uh, positions for the relative positions are. They're going to be the same uh, in this case. But if I memorize the absolute uh, mode numbers, and then I'm able to go to the different modes like the Dorian and still say, oh, the Dorian is on absolute mode number number two. Then I can easily locate the shapes over here based on me memorizing the shapes based on absolute mode numbers, which are which are relative to the, the major's key. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do. So that, so that means I have to memorize basically the, the mode numbers here and then we have to memorize the intervals because the intervals will help us. Uh, it's another way to see it, right? So if I build up the, the scale, I can build it out by shape and I can memorize the shape. And I can say, well, this shape, if I start from here, is gonna be a C major. And I'm just gonna say I'm playing from there in shape number four. That's one way to see it. Another way to see it is to just say, I'm gonna start from this note and build all the intervals around that note and what you will end up with is shape number, what I call shape number four. And so that's just another way to see it where, where it can help you to navigate around the guitar because then I can say, 
I can pick any C, right? I don't have to be in shape number four. I can pick this C up here and I might not be able to orientate myself and say, well, what shape am I in in terms of my five shapes on the guitar? But what I can do is I can say, well, the, the, I, if I start from there, I know it has a major second to it. I, I know it's got a, a major third to it and, you know, and so on and so forth. So I can build out the shape. And that's why we want to also learn the intervals and then try to learn the, the relative shapes of each of the intervals relative to this shape, which means I'm going to learn all these little shapes. But then I have to adjust all those little shapes when I go over the fault line here because the shapes are going to be different because of the kink in the tuning. So that's kind of the project that we're putting together. We're going to say that the, the major intervals are fairly easy to know because the intervals were based on the major scale, meaning they're all going to be called perfects or majors and the majors. And the order that I would suggest learning the intervals are first on the major scale, which isn't actually what I did because I, I practiced learning the minor scale before the major scale because that's just what I naturally started to play in because I was playing in that this one shape. But yeah, it would be easiest to learn the majors and then learn all of the minors intervals, which are basically just going to convert all the majors to minors, except you still have a major second. The perfects remain the same. And then learn the related intervals in whatever scale that you prefer. The minor scales would be the Dorian and the Phrygian, comparing them to the related main major, Aeolian, in which case there's only going to be one interval difference. And then we compare the two other uh, major scales, Lydian and Mixolydian, to the main major, that being the Ionian, which will once again only have one interval difference. So that's the approach I would you know, kind of suggest going through. If you do that systematically like I've been doing here, I'm starting to, I think I'm getting a better and better grasp of it, but I have to think about it a little bit each day and then you just get a better grasp of it i feel like so that's going to be uh the strategy here and so that means that we have uh, a perfect first now i'm also naming remember the naming convention is perfect first is on on the same note so it is what it is the second we're going to say is a, a major second and and that means it's a two note away major second so that two means the actual distance in our our baseline units which are half steps the second over here means it's the second of the shape of of the scale so this is a third it's going to be a major third major third means that it's four notes away in terms of distance and half steps we have a perfect fourth it's five notes away that's what that five means so it's the fourth note which is actually five notes away from c or the or the baseline note uh, of the scale we have a seven note away perfect fifth so the fifth means it's the fifth note in our scale and it's seven notes away from the base note of the scale or the root of the scale then we have a sixth which is a major six and it's nine notes away meaning it's nine half steps away from the baseline and then we have the seventh which is a major seventh meaning it's 11 notes away and so it's a little bit hard for us to count up wh what does it mean to be 11 notes away and that's again i think something that a lot of people don't have an understanding of they just memorize the shapes which is cool but if you understand the distance between the shapes you can then get some surety of where you are at by counting from one to the other so again people often don't know like that that a perfect fifth is actually seven steps away on the guitar in particular as opposed to the piano because on the guitar you're typically going to be playing that on two strings and people don't know how to count the notes between two strings so that's what we're going to practice doing if you can do that then you can prove to yourself that you are playing the right note by counting the the interval so to do that we have to know not only that it's a perfect fifth but that it's seven notes away from the root and the distance between the strings which is basically five notes for most of them except where the fault line is so that's what we'll do here we're going to go into shape number four which is uh you could which i call it shape number four because if you say this is shape number one 
which a lot of people do, but it's just a convention. Then this would be shape number two. This would be the start of shape number three. That's shape number four. There's only five shapes. So that's going to be one way that you can see it. You can also call it a C shape because if I looked at the related major scale, I'm in the major scale. The caged system is based on the, the Ionian scale. That's our Rosetta, our Rosetta Stone shape mode when we think about our our caged system and you can see if I build a chord which I'm also in open position which is shape number four as well you get a C chord so you could call it the C shape remembering that if I build my shape off of the C chord there's only three notes in the C chord and there's seven notes in the scale so if I look at this shape and I say does the shape fit into my seven note position if it does, I'm, and I'm going to say then it's a C shape, I can't do that because there's more than one of the five shapes where that C, three note C, will fit into the seven note shape. But there's only one position of the five positions where that C three note chord will fit into the pentatonic. So remember what you have to do if you're using a caged system is to then say this shape fits uniquely in what I would call the five note I'm calling it a hamburger barbell shape, right? So this is the five note pentatonic shape where you play the outside of the barbell. This is the barbell, only the outer notes, boom, 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 boom. And then you play the hamburger. Here's the hamburger, the three notes. Here it is without the kink in the tuning. Here's the kink in the tuning, right? And so, so that's one way that you can break out the the shape further into its baseline components, which I think of as either breaking out the five string instrument, five strings plus an extra E string into three strings and two strings. That's what we're doing here. In this shape, we're breaking out the shapes further into smaller chunks, which are more memorizable because our mind can only remember like seven things at a time. And so we've got like one, two, three, four, five, six notes in this hamburger shape that we're kind of chunking together and memorizing here. And then we've got our barbell uh, shape. So, and then if I wanna go from that to the seven note shape, I can then simply add the two notes that have been removed, which would be the handle in the middle of the barbell. And then it would be this little hat on the end of the hamburger, which is easier to see over here. I imagine put a ball cap on the hat, a baseball cap here with the bill. And then you have to balance out the weight of the baseball cap to another little bit on the tail of it. So that's how I uh, visualize that. And then you could also visualize it with a seven note. This is my seven note shape, which would be that if I break the shape into a two string, two string, one string sub shapes, we've got what I would call the double stop, uh, double stop house. This is what I'm calling the house analogy. And then we've got the house double stop and then you've got the two note per string flat. So that's another way that you can see that, which I think is useful because it's easy to see this square, which is where our half steps are, which is important because the half steps are often the defining characteristics when we move from mode to mode and also the things that we typically remove when we go from a seven note major to a five note pentatonic, as you can see that if you wanted to go from a seven note major to a five note pentatonic, we can remove the corners, meaning this one and this one, that would be the Lydian. And I mean, this would be the, the Locrian and the Lydian, the two L's, the two L's for some reason are the ones uh, that get removed. So, so the next thing we, as we go through our shape, then what I want to know is, can I see this shape in terms of where are all the modes housed? I'm not so concerned with the first through seven relative positions because those relative positions will change as we go to the next mode. In this case, the relative positions are the same as what I'm calling the absolute mode number positions. But when we go to another mode, the relative positions will change. And then I don't want to have to memorize a whole new set of relative positions. I want to be able to say, I want to convert the relative positions to the absolute mode numbering positions because for example this d is is what i would call uh the mode number two it's still the mode number two over here right so then i can find that so if i can if i can do that 
then I can look at these shapes. I'm not trying to find the shape by note. I'm not trying to find them by note per se. I'm trying to find them by relative position in the shapes because that's the thing that's movable. So, so then I'm, as we go through our shape, I'm going to try to try to locate where each of the modal numbers are with our analogy, with our house analogy and our barbell uh, hamburger analogy. So that's what we'll, we'll go through, but we're going to go through the bottom bit around the top. And that's going to be, uh, and that's because that's where we left off uh, last time. All right. So that's what we'll do. But before we jump into that, I want to first think about just to break things up. Uh, are, are some of these other ways we can see the shape. So this is how we can see it and break in the car guitar into five equal shapes, which is very useful for chord construction with multiple strings because I can, I can most easily grab multiple strings this way. But there's pros and cons to other shapes. And so I want to see the three note. I want to focus on this one a bit because I was thinking about some of the pros and cons of this shape, which is, which is, all we're doing is changing the rule so that instead of instead of having however many notes are in our shape and we don't span further than four frets in this shape we're going to always span three we're going to go three notes whether it spans four frets or five frets and you can see what happens to the shape it it kind of moves up uh this way on the shape so so that's so 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 what are the benefits, pros and cons of this shape? One of the benefits that I, I'd like to start practicing now is that a lot of people see their, their, their chords. When you build a chord out of the, you, you're saying, okay, here's my song. I'm in the key of C. Here's all my notes. And I want to build chords off of those notes. Well, what do I build? Do I build a major chord or a minor chord? Well, if in your, if you're in the major key, then you can start to memorize that the one, four, five builds a major triad chord, which has a major third, and the two, three, six builds a minor triad, which has a minor third. And then the question is, well, how do I play that? Well, we could build each of those based on the intervals for a major and minor triad, but a lot of people just memorize the shape of bar shapes, right? That's like one of the first, so that's gonna be easier for us to move up the guitar with bar shapes. So, so if I know the major and minor bar shapes, then I would like to have all of my notes on the top two strings, which if you use the three note per string anal if, you know, method is what happens, right? Because if I was on this, if I was, if I was using C here, this is what I would call shape number two, where, where it's based on, you might also call it from the caged system, an E major shape, which starts on, on the second note, and it goes from the first to the second, and then the third is down here, the fourth, the fifth, and then the sixth is down here. So, so you kind of, when you're trying to, if you're trying to convert each of those notes to a chord, you could do it, but you're starting to get past the, the two strings. Whereas if you look, if you, if you can visualize this shape might be your main shape that you visualize, but you also recognize with the major scale you have this three this three note shape where I can reach up here. That's, I have that third as well, and this third. Then I can say, well, look, now I have all of my notes on the top two strings, which I can make into bar chords pretty easily, right? So, so that means, and how do I make them into a bar chord? Well, I, I know that the first would just be my my E shaped bar chord. And notice when I play that, I'm actually in the E shape, right? It's a three note chord that's playing all five strings, but it's only playing three notes because some strings are repeated. If I go then to the next one on the, on the D, so, so now I'm going to the D. Well, I know that's the second, and I know that the second has a, is a minor shape. So then I can play you know, my minor shape up here, and then I can go to the, to the E, which is also a minor that's the third, and the third is a minor, which is kind of hard to reach on this guitar because I don't have the cutout. But the third would be a minor, right? And then I can't really play that up here because my I'm losing space. But and then I go to uh, the fourth goes back to the major. So now we're on the second string, 
a major is an A shape. So it'd be an A shape bar chord. So I'm just, I'm just the leaning forward bar chords. And then we're on the fifth, which is going to be a major, which would also be an A shaped bar chord. By the way, uh, notice that that this A shaped bar chord is fitting in two shapes. That's what I mean. Like if you were to if you were to think about these shapes as tying them to the the th three note shapes into the into the into the five chunks of the guitar, uh, you'd have to tie it into the pentatonic because see what's happening here is I'm using this the same shape uh, for for two that would span two shapes. I can't name both of those shapes the A shape from the cage system. The only reason it fits in two shapes is because we're looking at the seven notes in the chord. But if I cut it down to five notes, it would only fit uniquely in one of those two shapes, right? And it would be it would be in in what I call see this one right here is what I call shape number three. And why is this? Yeah, right here, shape number three, and that would be then the. Well, I'm getting I'm getting all messed up here because it, we would be playing we would be we would be looking at the relative major in this case would be uh, the C major, which that would be a D shape down here. But the point is they only fit uniquely in in the five note shape. So I won't get into that much more here. Let's go. We're going this one, and then we've got the A which is a minor, so now I'm on the second string, and so we have then the, the A shape bar chord. So, so notice what happens then with this shape, which is quite nice in the major, because it happens, it just so happens that we're on what I call the middle of the, of the pillars when we do the three notes per string. See, if I, if I look at the Gs, if I started on G, we'd have the th what I call the three pillars. Boom, boom, boom. But we're starting in the middle because we're starting on a major. We're starting on the major, which is C major. So we're at the, at the middle of the three pillars and then the bottom. And because we're playing three notes per string and there's only uh, seven notes in the scale, we're playing all of the, the main ones that we want on the top two strings, which is great because that's the easiest way for us to build our our major chords and then we're just missing the locrian which most of the peop most people leave off for the most part anyways and then even if i don't know how to play like even if i don't know which are the major and the minor and i just know i can just leave off the major and minor and make it a pentaton i can make it a power chord right so i could just say like from here to here is a power chord from here to here is a power chord from here to here uh, is a power chord from here to here's a power chord from here to here's a power chord the fifths are always the same whether it be major or minor so i could just take that shape the power chord shape right and then down here and i can mute this i can mute the top string so that's a pretty use that's pretty useful way to see it to be able to, to visualize this three note per string in conjunction with this one because again it helps us to, to build those kind of lean forward shapes let's let's go through the the intervals real quick just to see what the differences are let's just take a look at the intervals this is my normal major shape this is what i would call shape number <clears throat> two or you might just call it the uh the e major shape uh, e major bar chord shape that's playing a C. I'm playing a C with an, with an E bar chord shape, right? And so then, and so the second, it has it has a it has a two note away major second. It has then uh, a three note away minor third. So instead of going to this third, I'm going down to this third if I'm staying in what I call shape number two. So that's a four note away, minor third. And then it's got a five note away, perfect fourth, which is right underneath. So see how I'm just building the shape with the intervals. Five note away, perfect fourth. So, and then if I, if I have then, this is gonna be the seven note away, perfect fifth. 
And then the next one's going to be a nine note away major six. So I'm not going to go out here. I'm going to go back here for now. And then we've got the 11 note away major seven, which is going to be, and then the octave. Now, if I compare that to the three note per string shapes, notice all that's happening is we're, is we're using a different set of rules. So I still have the same second, two note away major second, but then instead of going down to this third, because I haven't gone three strings up from this one, and I don't have to worry about the fact that it spans greater than four frets, because that's not the rule I'm going by, I'm gonna reach up to this one. So that's my four note away major instead of this. Notice that's easier to do from a moving, I have to shift my hand to, get to, to do this third. This third, I can just reach up there and grab it. So that's a, that's a benefit. And then we go down to, uh, then we go to the fourth, which is in the same area. That's a four, four note away. Uh, wait a second, I already did that one. That was a four, I just did a four note away major third. And now I'm on the five note away perfect fourth, right underneath, that's the same under both positions. And then, oh, my pink, I can't get my pick in my holdings position. And then same for the four note, five note away perfect fourth. Wait a sec, five note away perfect fourth, seven note away perfect fifth, which was this one. That's the power chord, which is the same and then the nine note away. So here's the difference. Instead of going back here, I go back here. Notice that's easier in some ways. It's a longer reach, but I have to shift my fingers to go back here. Same interval. And then, and then we have the 11 note away uh, major seven, which is the Locrian, and that's the same. So that's interesting. So now the other thing to note that if, if I'm in the major key, you've got the one, four, five, where does the one, four, five live, which is kind of interesting. You've got the one, two, three, therefore the four is right underneath and the five is over here. So you have the one up top and then you've got the, uh, the Lydian or the perfect fourth, the fourth mode, fourth, and then you've got the fifth over here with is the mixolydian. So some people I've heard someone call that the L, an L, they call it an L7 shape. So here's the L and then this is a, a seven, I guess an L7, it might be a way to visualize it. But if I played that, I can say, well, then I can go up here from power chords. I can play that C and then the G. And then I can go down to the F from this F to play the power chord. The fifth of that would be the C. FC power chord and then I can play of course the power chord of uh, the G to the D right and then I could build a full a full bar chord on it which means that I would build a bar chord like this E bar chord and then when I go down to the F because I'm on the second string and I want to build a major bar chord that would be the A bar chord and then when I go to the G it's also on the second string of course therefore I just shift that A bar chord up and then when I go to the minors if I went to the minors then I could think about it this way. I could go to the minor key, right? Which would be the one, four, five of the minors, which would be if I convert that to the mode of the Aeolian or minor mode, there's the A and then the, the E and the D. So that's gonna be the, the minor uh, construction, which is a little bit kind of wonky here. It's a little kind of backwards uh, to see it that way. Uh, but you might most, more likely see it like as an an A and a D and an E this way, right? So we'd probably on the minor start here, A, D, E. So, so that's useful. 
But note, the other thing I just want to point out is that you can also build, once I know these chords, I can start building other chords on top, like another way to build the chord would be the lean back. This is what I call the lean back shape. So now with the C, I'm going to lean back this way, right? So I know that C's there. So I can, so if I, if I was noodling around, I could play it this way or possibly just play like the third, right? The third and the root. Maybe I don't grab the fifth, but the fifth would be back there. And then if I went to the next one, I could say, okay, that's going to be the minor now. So if I do a lean back chord, now that I know my intervals related to that D, then I'd go up to the D and say, okay, I'm not going to play that third. I have to go back to the minor third and the fifth is the same. Notice we have the relative position for the fifth is the same. So, and then if I go to the E, this is going to be the fourth. So I can do a lean back chord here and say, okay, lean back chord. You might call this like a, a G shape chord because it would be here duh, 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 down to here. It'd be like a G shape if you're using a cage system. But one, three, five, if you just look at the intervals. And then we could go to, and then if I go down here, I could do the same thing. So now I'm to the F, which is a major. So same construction. The third is right there. That's my third shape. And the fifth shape is still right there. I haven't crossed the fault line. So the structure of the shape is the same as it was on the major. So if this was the major up top, I could just move that whole shape down here. And I could mute this top one possibly with my thumb if you want to do that, although that's not like some people might frown upon that. And then you go to the next one which is going to be the G that's also a major. So that means it's just shifting up as is. And then we go to the A and that's also going to be the major or I'm sorry, minor. can end it back on the C. So in any case, so that's another way that we can basically see it. Uh, so, y y y so if I was to say, okay, the other, notice that you can also build chords where it's in the middle. So this is what I call, what we just did is what I, what I call a lean forward position and then a lean backwards position. And then of course, if you're in, if you're down further on the guitar, you could have it going upwards, right? Because if I was on, if I was on uh, like this F, for example, then then another way I can see it is, well, what's the what, where, if I go above it, what do I have above it? Well, usually, normally when I go, I look at it down this way. So if I went from here to here, as we looked at our intervals, that would be a perfect fourth. And the inverse of that would be, uh, it would be a perfect fourth that's five notes away. The inverse would be a 12 minus five, which would be a seven note away, perfect fifth. So if I go from F to C and I see F as the focal point, then this would be the fifth of it. And then I also need a major third because this is a major scale, which would be my interval down here. So then if I look at this shape from the perspective of F, this is an inverted, you know, F major. So this is, this is what I would call it. So we had our, if I started from F and I leaned it back this way, we'd have what I would call my lean back shape, which you might call more like a C shape when you're going this way from a caged system. We've got the lean forward shape, which would be like an A type of shape. And then we've got basically the in between, like F is in the middle shape, right? Which is gonna be, the, the inversion shape, which is kind of the top, if you look at the cage system of like the C, because you might play the C, some people will play the C like that, where they add that top note on it. But often when we're up here, we're just looking for three 
strings, so you could just play these top three notes, and that could be a, a way that you can you could see the whole thing as well. So I'm just trying to say how these intervals could help us, and basically how like being able to view these three notes per string might be useful. I think it's quite useful on the major and also on the mixolydian, because on the mixolydian we start up top. I'm looking at G in this case in the key of G mixolydian. And you've got that full three pillar shape up top. So once again, you've got your power chords right there, which you can convert into the majors or minors, which is a little bit more difficult because the mixolydian uh, isn't just the one, four, five major. You have to be able to say, okay, which, which chords are major and minor in a mixolydian, which you could use our little math exercises that we'll take a look at possibly when we get back to the C. Now notice, just before we get back to the C, that if I, if I take that concept back here, this is our same, inter this is our same scale, basically just putting together the lean back shapes. So what I did, what we have here is, is when I looked at the three note per string, from C to here, one way we can look at that is we took this C, we took this D which is the minor right and if I just put those two together then I actually get my scale I could just say well this here's the first of the here's the the one the one of the first the the one of of the second right of the Dorian and then here's the here's the two of the Ion of the three of the Ionian and the three of the Dorian here's the five of the Ionian and the five of the Dorian. And so then I can keep going, but that will be, but that's our. So, right, this is just another way to see it, that, that I'm just, I'm, I'm using these lean back shapes and now putting them together, which I can now view as, instead of, instead of viewing them as like, okay, these are lean back shapes that I put together based on the three note per string, uh, based on the three note per string uh, uh, system to see these three notes and then I just built a lean back shape on it or you might call it a G shape uh, kind of thing, right? Instead, I'm thinking of it first basically thinking of those shapes and then making that into the scale which gives me, which gives me basically our, our two note per string scale which is another way you could see it. You could see the scale as a two note per string which is kind of just simply linking together the lean back shapes, which actually lean back, if you go through all notes, it leans back all the way down the guitar, and you could just link those together, and you come up with another way that you could see your, your entire scale. And then, of course, on these scales, if I saw it this way, you can see it the other way, right? I could say, well, if I'm playing this way, I'm going to do a lean forward. I'm looking at the lean back shape that made my, that made my scale, but then I'm going to build a lean forward a lean forward chord on it. So here's a lean forward E chord, and then here's a, a lean forward D minor chord, and then I'm going to go down to the lean forward uh, E, and that's going to be an E minor, which is an A, an A shaped, and then F is going to be a major, so that's an, it's an A shape, and then you can go down to the G, which is going to be a major, so it's going to be like a D shape. And then you go to the A, which is going to be a minor, which will look something like this. Anyway, so, all right, enough of that. Let's go back to the, to the heart of things. So now we're going to go back here, and I'm going to be in this shape. I'm on the C. I'm going to go around the horn to this C looking at our intervals uh, here. Before we do though, let's do a joke. Let's do a joke, this is my practice session joke. It's got a little politics in it, so try not to be offended. <clears throat> here we go. Whenever thinking about music theory, most people like discussing the pros and cons. And obviously, w whenever learning anything, it's good to consult the pros in the field to, to see what they're thinking, right? So I get it. I get consulting the pros. 
But why do I why why do I want to, the advice of the cons? I mean, do do we really need to con consult the criminals here? Like, what are we? What is this? Some kind of what? Like the Democratic Party trying to buy election votes? We don't need to. Why would we consult the cons for music theory? Why not just talk to the pros out there? So we we don't need the advice of cons unless unless we're seeking to learn how to make like a like a toothbrush into a into a makeshift shiv knife shank thing otherwise i don't really see the benefits it's like it's like well you know th this is what julian lage professional bluesy jazz player has to say about the essence of music and it's like okay that's interesting and then it's like and, and because we really need to be to to balance things out when thinking about guitar theory we also must get the opinion of this con Scarface, who, who, who's been locked up for abusing his neighbor's cat. Equal, equal perspective, balanced opinions and all that, you know? And it's like, so, so, you know, actually some say that Scarface barbecued his neighbor's cat along, along with some local park geese, but, but the mainstream sewage media, mainstream of sewage media won't let us, won't let us say that. They won't let us say that on the YouTube. So I won't. I'm not going to say that. I won't say that because because I, I will for the sake of humanity and civil discourse and monetization uh, refrain from mentioning. I won't even mention the idea of, of neighbor cat eating or the delicacy of park pond turtle. I, actually, you know, he was, I don't even think he was, I don't know the story or anything, but I don't even think he was arrested for eating cats, even though they say there was like strong evidence, but, but this is just, this is just rumor, but, but it, w it wouldn't be politically correct to arrest him for eating cats these days. That's a, that's a no, no, apparently. So, so he was actually arrested for coughing up a fur ball on, on some lady's gouchy shoes as she as she exits her her BMW with some Hollywood California license plate on it to enter some fine dining restaurant the the furball coughing at that point being considered quote disturbing the peace which apparently apparently that qualifies for action to be taken the the, the police the police are completely stumped as to how one man could have had so much fur in him as to warrant arrest over furball coughing you know it's a mystery honestly modern modern mysteries these days are more complex than like sherlock holmes out there it's tough to it's tough to see what's going on around here i tell you anyways i'm sorry but unless unless the con has some kind of, of advice about how cat gut strings play better on the guitar than nylon or steel strings or maybe maybe how fur balls in your throat Make make a cool like damp, dampened vocal quality to your singing. I feel like consulting the con is a waste of time here, and we should just stick to talking to the pros. Plus, I just think it's funny that that as a country, what we choose to to get upset about with whatever the the big T man's the <laughs> the big T man rhetoric, you know, because because honestly, he. He says over the top hyperbolic statements all the time. So it's just kind of interesting to note which ones of those hyperbolic statements become the talking points, right? I mean, I mean I'm I'm not sure anybody is actually eating cats, but seriously, is it is it really that offensive to say that a starving person might start looking at cats and dogs as dinner? I mean the the Beverly Hillbillies were eating roadkill possum for crying out loud. And that even after they became rich, they were still eating roadkill possum, and no one was no, no, no one was really offended about the implications. I mean, starv starving people stuck in the mountaintops have eaten their own foot for crying out loud. It, it, like, like if it's between starving or cooking up my good old horse Trotter, uh, Trotter will most likely not be trotting anymore. I don't see why that's. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure that's offensive, but I don't, I don't really get it. Anyway, let's get back to the music. 
All right, let's start. Let's start at this C here, and then we're gonna go around. So we're on the C major. That means where does the C live? It lives in our seven-note uh, house analogy. It's gonna be in what I call the penthouse of the house, the top right of the box, looking towards what I call the ocean over here. That's where mode one, the Ionian mode, in essence, is going to be uh, living. All right, and and in terms of the five note per string or pentatonic hamburger barbell analogy. It's at the bottom of the hamburger, which is easier to see over here because you could, it doesn't have the kink in the tuning. Bottom left, the major support, bottom left bun of the hamburger is where we're starting. And then it's on the right side of the barbell. All right. And so if I was to then go from top to bottom and, and count through just to count through uh, this, this whole steps and half steps, we've got the one is gonna be a uh, whole step to the two, and then the two, it's a little bit frustrated on my finger, but it's gonna be a whole step from two to three, and then it's gonna be, the three is gonna be a half step to four. The half step is within the, the box here, or the house, and the four is gonna be a whole step to five, boom, and then this repeats up top. So this is the same boom, boom, boom. So if we just uh, adjust our fingering up here, we're on the G, and then I'm gonna go to the six. And so the six is gonna be a whole step to the six. And then if we go to the seven, we've got a whole step to the seven, and then we have a half step to go from seven back home to eight. So notice that the the major scale is interesting because remember where the half steps are, the half steps, that's gonna be the important, one important characteristic that we can kind of use to differentiate the different modes because the half steps are always gonna be in this box shape, but it depends where we start as to where the half steps are gonna be if we look at relative positions from the first through the seventh. So in this case, we start right on the, the outside of the house here. So we've already, we're already on the end of the box. So therefore we're gonna go, there's gonna be one note in, be, in between before we get back to the box. So one to two, two to three, and then we have three to four is gonna be our half step. And then we're gonna, we're gonna get to, the next box isn't gonna happen until we have two notes in between. So we have this note in between and then it goes around the horn and this note in between before we get back to the box. And that means it's not until we get back to seven and eight. So one way to see this in terms of the major scale is to realize that one half step is right behind it, right? It's the half step that leads into it. That's the leading tone. So that means that we know that one half step is gonna be the seven to the eight or seven back to one. And the second half step is gonna be from the uh, four to five, so one to two, one to two, three, two to three, and it's gonna be three to four. So three to four is gonna be the, the second uh, one. So three to four, seven to eight. Now the other thing useful to, to realize that I'm trying to get in my mind is the relationship between the half steps and the pentatonic scale. So you can see the pentatonic scale is the five notes in green, the five positions here, and then, and then the two positions that are excluded, what are the two ones that are excluded in terms of modes? The ones with the L's for some reason are the ones removed. So that's gonna be the Lydian and uh, the, the Locrian. So we keep all the minors in there, which is kind of interesting. So the Lydian and the Locrian are the ones removed. Those are the ones that are at the edges of the box, which, so that kind of makes sense because the, they're within the half steps and the half steps are the things that are gonna create more tension typically. So by removing them, you kind of can think of it as we're playing something a little bit safer, something that's possibly a little bit more ambiguous in terms of which mode are we in. We don't really know so much because we removed the half steps, which are often the distinctive factor to help tell us which mode we're in, which means we're a little bit safer possibly as we, as we maneuver around might be one way to kind of see it. But that also means that we can kind of determine where the, where the half steps are, because if I, if I look at this one, it's gonna be from three to four. So on the fourth, it's leading into the Lydian. So the one that's leading into the Lydian, that's the half step 
uh, that is that's going to be the half step. And then on the seventh, that's the other one that we remove, uh, which is going to be the Locrian, uh, which is the, 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 the Locrian is the B. And this one, it's leading out. So we're, we're, so it's from seven to eight. So the step from seven to eight or seven back to one is the half step in this case, leading out of the Locrian, the one that we remove. And the, the other half step is leading into the Lydian or the fourth of the major scale. So, and that means that if I go to these other ones, I can, I can say in the Dorian, I could start to think of this and say, okay, well, where's the, where's the Lydian and the Locrian? Here's the Lydian. And I'd still, I could still say, well, the one that's leading into the Lydian should still be the half step. So that means the half step's gonna be from two to three. And the one that's leading out of the Locrian, so here's the Locrian, and that in relative positions to the Dorian would mean from six to seven, right? Would that make sense? Because that would still be in the box over here. If I'm in the key of the Dorian, I'm still labeling these same ones by saying from B to C, that's that's going to be the half step, uh, which which is going to be the Locrian to the major. So I can label it that way. The absolute position or absolute mode number seven to absolute mode number eight is going to be removed. And then the absolute mode number three to the absolute mode number four is going to be removed. Right. So even if I'm in the Dorian, if I can name these as the absolute mode numbers, then I can all I can st I can be able to convert that to say, well, where's my half steps? It's been between the absolute mode number uh, seven to eight absolute mode number. And then and then where does that where does that lie here? Well, it's in the relative positions, uh, which are going to be seven to eight, which which is uh, uh, <laughs> here to here which is going from six to seven relative position of the Dorian. All right, I'm going to play with that concept a little bit more. That was just something that kind of uh, uh, I think is worth possibly pondering on. But let's move on for now because I've my brain is hurting from thinking about that. So let's go ahead and uh, if I played through this position, it would be one, two, three, four, five, and then it repeats. Sorry, I can't. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it repeats up top, right? So one, two, three, four, five, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so then let's go ahead and uh, do our our normal process. So the second of the major is a two note away major second. So I could see that because it's two notes away. The inverse is going to be 12 minus 2, which is 10. That would be a 10 note away minor 7. So if I go this one from C to D, 2 note away major 2nd. From D to C, 10 note away uh, minor 7. And then I also know that the second of the Ionian mode will also be the second mode. Notice that these two, once again, are the same right now. But when I go to Dorian, I'm going to keep the absolute mode numbers the same, even though the relative positions will be relative to the Dorian mode. So it's important to kind of learn those two. So I'm going to say, well, I'm on the second mode. That's going to be the Dorian. Where does the Dorian live in terms of our shape? Well, it's not in the house analogy in the house because it's a minor shape and the Phrygian is the only minor that lives in the basement of the house in, in that shape. So it's in the double stop shape. Uh, over here, top of the double stop, hanging with the mixolydian shape, and uh, so that's so that's going to be that one. Is there anything else I needed to say on that? I forgot what I was doing. So, and it's mode number two. Okay, let's just go to the next one. I got distracted. Let's go to the third. So then the third. Notice that there's no kink in the tuning between these two. So the relationship between these two are the same. If I was going from this one down here, then I'd have to deal with this fault line right there. But right now, no, I just go from here to here. Same, that'd be a four note away major third. How do I know that? Because I could just go normally as normal from here to here would be five notes away to the F and then back here would be four notes away. That's my normal shape. 12 minus four would be eight. So the inverse would be an eight note away 
uh, minor six. So if I play that normal, it's the normal top to bottom three note away major third, bottom to top eight note away major uh, six. And then I go to, and then I also know that the third of mode number one, Ionian mode, will be the third mode, of course. The third mode, I know I would build a major chord from because the two, three, six of the major has, a, I'm sorry, I would build a minor chord from because the two, three, six of the major scale is what I build my minor uh, chords from. All right, that's right. And, but beyond that, I would know that it's gonna be a Phrygian. So a Phrygian has a distinctive second, and I could see that right here. That second related to this E uh, is a distinctive second that is useful to know, uh, which I wouldn't know if I just noted that the two, three, six makes a minor chord. So I can, so that's an added piece that I can build like a more complex chord construction to possibly, which is why it's kind of useful. All right, let's, where does the Phrygian live? Well, in the, in the house analogy, it's in the, what I call the basement of the house. So it's the only minor living in the house and the bottom basement uh, of the house. And in the barbell analogy, this is what I missed last time that I was trying to figure out. It's in the barbell. You can see the full barbell up top. The, on the left-hand side, you've got the two heavy hitters on the minors, which is the Phrygian and the main minor, and the two heavy hitters on the right for the majors, which is the... Uh, the major on the bottom and the mixolydian. So here we're at the at the top there, okay, and and that's that. All right, so I think that's everything. Let's go to the next one. So now we're going to go to the four note the, the the fourth of a major scale is a five note away perfect fourth. And how do I know that's five notes away? Because the distance between two strings is five notes. There's no kink in the tuning, so it's just normal right here. The inverse is twelve minus five, which is a seven note away perfect fifth. Therefore, when I see that shape from top to bottom, five note away perfect fourth from bottom to top, seven note away perfect fifth. The fourth of mode number one, Ionian mode, the major scale, is the fourth mode, which is uh, the Lydian mode. And I also know that the fourth of the major scale is going to be a major chord because the one, four, five of the major scale are major chords. Beyond that, if I know it's the Lydian mode, the Lydian mode happens to have the interval of its fourth interval being the funny one, and the fourth interval is that really funny kind of augmented fourth, which is the same as like a flat fifth, which you could see more clearly up here. Here's that, here it is right there. So in relation to that, I can build a major chord from it, which has a major third right there, but it also is gonna have that augmented uh, fourth that I can throw in there, which I can't do with any other major chord because the Lydian has, is the one that has that distinctive interval to it. All right, where does the Lydian live? Well, in the, in the house analogy, it's on the bottom right of the house looking towards the ocean. And uh, in terms of the, if I was to convert from a seven note major to a five note pentatonic, it's the one that we would remove. We remove the top left and bottom right corners of the house, top left being the Locrian, bottom right being the Lydian. The two L modes are the ones that go. If I'm looking at the five note pentatonic barbell hamburger shape, you can see it's on the inside of the barbell. So here's my barbell shape. The, bar, the weight's on the end. The inside is the handle that I imagine averages out to the middle. It would be right next to the uh, Phrygian. That's the one that we would have to add from, to go from the pentatonic to the major. <clears throat> and that's it. All right, let's go to the next one. Then we're going to go to the fifth. The fifth of mode number one, the major scale, uh, is uh, a seven note away perfect fifth. So seven note away perfect fifth, which is our shape recognizable power chord shape right there. So so that's still a power chord, even though it's on the high strings right here. Like, that's a power chord. Power chord needs to be on the heavy E string, man. It's like, no, that's still a power chord. Okay, whatever. Doesn't seem very powerful unless you got a strong amp or something. But I'll take your word for it. How do I know it's seven notes away? Because it's gonna be five, six, seven. Uh, seven notes and the inverse 12 minus seven 
is five, five notes away, perfect fifth. So top to bottom, power chord, seven note away, uh, <clears throat> perfect fifth. Bottom to top is a five note away, perfect fourth. Okay, and the fifth of mode number one, Ionian, is mode number five. I also know that the fifth of the major scale will build a, ma a major chord because the one, four, five are the ones that we build major chords on, which means it has a major third and a normal fifth, but uh, we can also build more complex chord if I know the mode is the fifth mode, which is Mixolydian, which has all the same intervals related not to the, the root of the scale, but the root of the chord I'm creating now, which is in essence its own scale, which would be the Mixolydian scale, has a distinctive seventh which would be the, uh, which would be a 10 note away minor seventh, which is the only one that has that distinct seventh that would still fit into the same scale when we're on the Ionian, which I wouldn't know unless I know the mode. Okay, let's do the same thing up top here. So I'm gonna go up top and, oh, by the way, where does Mixolydian, where does Mixolydian live? Uh, it's in, it's, it's the one major mode that doesn't live in the house because it's like, I'm out of here, dude. I'm doing my own thing. I'm not hanging with the C's. And so it's over here in uh, the double stop and uh, and uh, in terms of the barbell analogy, it's on the right side of the barbell where the heavy hitters or the weights of the he of the of the major are. All right, let's go back up top. I'm gonna compare this E to this C down here, which means we're going past an octave and we're going inverted, because usually I measure this way, but now I'm gonna measure from the bottom string to the top string. How does that work? Let's go back up to the third. We know that that shape is still gonna be a, uh, a four note away major third, which I could see if I made a bar chord, you could, and you counted out, that would be the third, but let's check it out. How do I know that? Well, I could count down this way, where it would be uh, five, and then I could go to that C, five, six, seven, eight. So that would be eight notes away. Or if I went this way, five, 10, 15, and then 20, because of the kink in the tuning, it goes up to 20, there's only 12 notes, 20 minus 12 uh, would be like 10 minus two, which would be eight. So, so if I went from this to this, this would be an eight note away. So that wouldn't be in a bar chord. What am I talking about? That would be an eight note away uh minor six and the inverse therefore would be 12 minus eight which would be a four note away uh major third so you so that's how we might be able to figure that out if i saw this usually i would count this way to this way or possibly to the closest c that i'm looking at and then take the inverse if I want to see it from measured from this side to that side, right? And so let's and so that if I and then if I, by the way, I also know that this is the Phrygian mode. So remember, if I'm on the top, it's more likely that we can easily see how we would construct our chords, which would be a minor chord like this that has only three notes in it. But then I can throw in this second right here, which has that distinctive. Phrygian second, and I also have it down here. So I can shift this finger up to here, right? So if I'm playing this, I could be like, and get that tensiony sound, which I can only do on the Phrygian minor. I can't do it on the Dorian on the two, and I can't really do it on the six. I could but it won't be in the same key. That note will not be in the key of the related Ionian mode, which is why it's, that's kind of useful to know. And then if I go to the, to the F, uh, which is the Lydian, and I wanna compare this, so now we're on this one compared to this, we're gonna say that's gonna be the fifth now, which is a five note away perfect fifth. How do I know that? Well, if I count it down this way, it'd be five, six, seven, or 5, 10, 15, this would be 20 up to here, back to 19, 19 minus 12, because there's only 12 notes, is basically my minus two, which is seven. So this from here to here, looks like it's a seven note away perfect fifth, therefore the inverse would be a five note away perfect fourth. Okay, and 
it's useful to note that that's the Lydian. So I know it's the fourth, so most people would say, okay, I can make a major chord, which I can't really finger too easily right here. I can make a major chord, but I also know that it's the Lydian mode, which has a distinctive fourth to it. And the fourth is like the flat fifth, so it's, it's, it's right here. It has that distinctive B. So if I'm playing this major right here, I can play it like, is there a B that I can throw in there that'll make it sound like kind of Lenny? I can shift my finger back. I can only do that on the Lydian major, major. I can only do it on the, on the Lydian. I can't do it on the Mixolydian when I play the fifth, right? I can't do it on the Ionian because the Lydian is the only one that has the distinct fourth compared to the root of the chord we're playing that still fits in the key of Ionian. I could do it to the other ones, of course, but you'd be adding a note to the scale, whereas here you're still in the, the same scale you're in because you're playing within the related mode, which has a distinctive uh, interval. All right, let's go to the, to the Mixolydian. So the Mixolydian is here. We could say do it from here to here. I can't really reach that. That's going to be difficult. And let's say, so that's going to be, uh, and, and what would that be? I can't really reach it. I won't play it because I can't really reach it, but because of my, I need a cut out. But that would be, uh, we know it's a seven note away, perfect fifth. I could see that because the note underneath it is five notes away, but I could go five, 10, 15, 20, 19, 18, 17, 17 minus 12 notes is seven minus two, seven, six, five. That would be a five note away perfect fourth going this way and therefore going the other way would be 12 minus five, which would be a seven note away perfect fifth. Okay, so then, and also on that one, I can say, let's go to this G over here just to get the concept down. So if I went to this G, I could say, okay, what if I build my major chord off of that because I know the fifth would build a major chord. What's going to be the distinctive factor here? Well, I know that the Mixolydian mode, the fifth mode, has a distinctive seventh, which is going to be the the uh, the distinctive seventh. Uh, and I know how how do I get which is going to be a minor seven. How do I get there? Well, the, if I remember my shapes now, the minor seventh is like that. So how can I get so how can I get that into this shape? I can lift up my pinky and bar it off. So that's that dominant seven. So that dominant seven, which most people kind of know from the blues, I could play that dominant seven shape on all one, four, five, but on the one and the four, it's not inside of the actual scale. It's only actually fitting in the scale if I'm playing the mixolydian related to the major that that note is actually not outside of the c major scale whereas if i did that same thing on the one and the four you could still do it it might sound cool probably will but those notes aren't actually in the same key right that's why it sounds a little wonky which is cool wonkiness is cool as long as the house doesn't fall down some crooked timbers make it give it some character you know it gives it a little gives it a little character all right, anyways, let's go to the next one. So now we're on uh, the sixth. Uh, let's compare. So we're on this one compared to this one. And that's going to be a... Uh, uh, so we know that that's going to be a nine note away major six. How do I know that? Well, I could compare it this way. One, two, three to get to here. Or five, 10, 15, minus 12, five, minus two is three so if i went this way this would be a three note away minor third therefore the inverse is 12 minus three nine note away major six and then we got the seventh i'm getting a little tired so i think i'm gonna think i'm gonna stop on that on this stuff there and let's do let's do a quick look and practice our our intervals around one spot again so I'm just gonna do my same practice comparing. I'm gonna construct my shapes again around the key of A all in one place, imagining I'm rotating 
from a major interval to major interval, minor interval to minor interval to get an idea of the shape. So if I was to say, for example, that I'm in what I call shape number two, this is gonna be, the, well, you might call it the major shape, you might call it an E shape from the caged system, then it would look like this if I played up the scale. Right? And then, and then, uh, so that, and if I looked at my intervals and just say, well, how is that being built? If I built this shape, it would just be, okay, I've got, I've got the one to a two note away, major second. And then I've got the third. I'm not going to go out here to the third, but rather back here to stay in my shape. That would be a four note away, a major third. And then I've got a five note away, perfect fourth. So that's just going to be right underneath. Five note away, perfect fourth. And then I know I've got a seven note away, perfect fifth. That's going to be a power chord shape. So that looks like this. Seven note away, perfect fifth. And then I know that I have a nine note away, major six. And then I know that I have an 11 note away, uh, major seven. And a octave now the other way you can build this shape by the way is you can think about the whole steps and half steps between each of them right which is it's going to be a whole step from one to two whole step from two to three half step from three to four whole step from four to five whole step from five to six whole step from six to seven half step from seven to eight right so that's the other so those are the the ways we build the ways i know where i'm at is number one i just know the shape shape number two right or i build it from intervals based on the root interval so i'm going to say well it has a perfect first major second major third perfect fourth perfect fourth major six major seven or i know the half step formula going from note to note whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half, right? Like, they could do that, right? One to two is whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half, right? So those are the three, three ways, and it would be nice if I can get each one of those down, which I'm obviously I'm not perfect at, but that's what I, I'm thinking I might practice towards. So now let's compare this major shape to its related, another related mode and just see how it differs. So this is the Lydian mode, only has one <clears throat> different, uh, different interval, that's the fourth. Lydian is kind of useful because if I memorize it as the fourth mode in terms of absolute modes related to the relative major, it happens that the fourth interval is the funny interval and the funny interval is, uh, is an augmented fourth. So if I see the same shape, what does that do to my shape? It converts my shape <clears throat> from shape number two to now I'm still in the same place, but I'm gonna be playing shape number four, <clears throat> which you might just call, I would call it the second note Lydian shape. Uh, that's one thing you could call it. Or if I looked at the cage system, I look at the related major, which is an E, which is right there. And if I build a shape around that E, lean back shape, you've got a C shape. So that means you might call it a, like a C shape from a caged system. It's the E chord C shape that we that we can build around. Uh, and and so then, uh, so then, if I was to play this from here, it would be. Whoops. Wait a sec. It's a little wonky because. One, two, three, four. There's the funny one. Five, six, seven, eight. So there's that wonky interval uh, that's gonna throw us a little bit that 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 we can emphasize to get that Lydian uh, in there. So that's the distinctive interval. So let's just count them out one at a time. So it still has a two note away major second. And then it's got the three, the four note away major third. Instead of going out here, I'm going back here. I could do either one. I could reach out there and go outside my shape, but inside shape four would be going back here. And then I've got the funny one, uh, <clears throat> which is gonna be 
the six node away, it says diminish six, but it's also an augmented fourth. I should, so the worksheet just don't let that bother you. Hopefully, two names for the same interval, but I need a fourth, and therefore we're going to call it a six note away augmented fourth. And then we've got the uh, back to normal, the seven note away perfect fifth. And then we've got the ninth, which is back to normal. Remember, we could play the ninth out here. It's a bit of a stretch, but doable. But we're going to play the ninth inside shape number four would be going back here. And then we go to the 11 note away major seven, which is here. And then back to the octave. So the distinctive notes between this and the major. By the way, I could start to see it in whole steps and half steps. And if I count that out, that might be useful. Remembering that the half steps are still in the box. So here's the box. So, and I also note that the half steps are in the two notes that are removed when I go to a pentatonic, which you'll recall are the two ones with an L in it, the two modes with an L, Locrian and, and uh, uh, Lydian. So from Locrian, it goes out of Locrian. So from four to five, you would expect a half step. And then the Lydian uh, is up top into Lydian. So that means from seven to eight, uh, you would expect a half step. Now that makes sense because seven to eight would be going home. And the other one is on, uh, is on the Locrian going out of the Locrian four to five, which is going from uh, four to five to the here to the rel, rel to the Ionian Locrian to the Ionian, okay. So if I count that out, then I would have whole step. Maybe I can say it that way. I can say it's going from it's going from the first, which is the Lydian, to the second, which is Mixolydian. First is a Lydian whole step to the second, which is Mixolydian. Second Mixolydian is a whole step to the third. Uh, which is Aeolian. The third Aeolian is a whole step to the fourth, which is Locrian. The fourth is a half step to the fifth, which is going to be uh, <laughs> the, Aeo the Ionian or major. The fifth is a whole step to the sixth, which is the Dorian. The sixth is a whole step to the seven, which is Phrygian. And the seven is a half step to the eight, which is Lydian. Interesting, what if I said it this way? First is a whole step to the second, which is absolute mode number four. Second is a whole step to the third, which is absolute mode number five. Third is the whole, whole step to the fourth, which is absolute mode number uh seven i messed up I'm, I'm not gonna do that right now my head's my head's hurting let's just say that the difference here between these two modes is the is these two right so if i didn't play those two i wouldn't really know if i'm in major or locrian Let's add the major. And then now let's switch to the Locrian. And then to the major. Whoops, I messed up. I don't know. Let's go to the next one. 
running long on time here. We got the, the mixolydian. So if I convert this from the major to the mixolydian, then the distinctive mode is going to, the distinctive interval is the seventh, which is a 10 note away minor seven. That converts what I would call shape number two from the major shape to what I would call shape number five, or from a, a, a caged system, I can look at the relative major, which is a D, and build my chord based on the D, which would be an A shape. So you might call this an A shaped uh, a D, right? An A shaped D shape, <laughs> an A shaped D chord shape. And then, uh, so, so, so that, or you might just call it a mixolydian shape, because if I played it from the top, we'd be playing mixolydian, which would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Where's the distinctive note? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There it is. Okay, and so then if I looked at my, if I looked at my intervals, just to count it out this way, I'm gonna say, all right, it's, what does it got? What do we got? We've got a two note away major second, and then we've got a four note away major third, which I could go out here to play, just to keep that in mind. But to stay inside the shape, I'm gonna go down here. So that's a four note away uh, major third. We've got a five note away perfect fourth, like normal. We've got a seven note away perfect fifth, seven note away perfect fifth. We've got a uh, nine note away major six, which we could play out here just to keep that in mind but to stay in the shape we're going to bring it back here nine note away major six and then we've got a distinctive minor which is a ten note away minor seven and then back to the octave so we don't have that leading tone to go back home as we typically do so where where are my half steps in here they're in the box so here's where the box lives. So if I was to try to count this out, it'd be one is a whole step to two, two is a whole step to three, three is a half step to four, four is a whole step to five, five is a whole step to six, six is a half step to seven, seven is a whole step to eight. So another way to see it is that the notes that would be removed in a pentatonic are the Locrian and the, uh, and the Lydian. So the Locrian, going out of the Locrian, means it's going from three to four. So three to four would be removed. That's the C sharp to the E, or to the D, C sharp to the D, that makes sense. And then going from into the Lydian, from the six to the seven, which, which is here to here. So if I know, so, so that's interesting to realize, okay, but let's not ponder that too much right now so we're going to say then that we have the distinctive seven here and here so those are the distinctive ones so if i was to play this through without those two <laughs> Now let's add the major seven. And now let's go to the minor seven. Anyway, 
Let's go then to the miner. So the miner has, I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna rebuild these shapes on the miner and we'll end up with what I call shape number one, which you might call from the cage system, the related Ionian would be the C shape, which would be a lean back shape, which I would call, you might call a G shape uh, uh, on that. So you might name the whole thing a G shape. And then all these three, uh, these three will be different than the major, even though we still have a major second and the perfects will remain the same. So let's just count that out. So if I look at this, this is just our shape number one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So one to two, still a major second, even though it's the main minor mode. But then it has a minor third, which is right there, which stays within our shape without having to go down a string. And then we've got the perfect fourth, which is the same to the major, because the perfects are the same. And then we've got a seven note away perfect fifth, which is the same to the major. And then we've got a eight note away minor six, eight note away minor six. Uh, hold on. And then we've got a 10 note away minor seven, 10 note away minor seven, and then the octave. So, where are my whole steps and half steps? We've got the one is a whole step to two, two is a half step to three, three is a whole step to four, four is a whole step to five, five is a half step to six, six is a whole step to seven, seven is a whole step to eight. So it's gonna be in the box. And if I look at where does the Locrian live, when I go into the Locrian, so going from, I'm sorry, out of the Locrian, so that happens on two to three. So two to three, two to three. And then we have going from the Lydian uh, from the, the Locrian to into the Lydian, which is from five to six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, and let's compare that then to the minor modes. Which is the door? Which is the Dorian? So we can say, all right, here, like, how would this change if I went to the Dorian? Well, it has a distinctive minor, uh, major ninth for a minor mode, which moves it to what I would call shape number three, from what I would call shape number one. You can also see it with the related major being the Ionian a G. So if I build from that G, it would be a D shape. So you might call it a D shape from the caged system, a D shaped A shape, a D shaped A chord shape. Or <laughs> so then I uh, and then I could say, okay, so what does the shape look like? It goes. Da, 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 da. Okay, let's look at the intervals. Where's my distinctive? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five. Instead of one two, one, two, three, four, five, six, instead of there. So we're gonna say, okay, uh, let's just let's just count that out. So we've got from one whole step to two. So that's the same as the minor, even though it has a major second, because most of the minors do, except for the Phrygian. And then we've got the two to the three is a three note away minor third. And then from the three to the four, is a five note away perfect fourth. Okay. And then from the four to the four, the five is a seven note away perfect fifth that we got. And then the sixth is a nine note away uh, minor six, which by the way, I could reach out there, which is kind of useful to know possibly, but we're bringing it back here. Uh, this is a nine note away major six. And then we've got the uh, 10 note away minor seven. And then back to the octave. So where's the funky, where's the note difference? It's right there. And it would be, uh, normally we play this one. 
That's what the change is. So if I play the normal minor, I can just play this note. And then switch to the door in. I'm reaching out to this note, past it, so right here. That's one way we can do it, or down here. Hold on a second. Hold on, hold on now. to the normal minor. Back to the door in. to the normal minor. I don't know, let's just finish this off with uh, the Phrygian. I'm getting tired. We're gonna say the Phrygian if I start from the A and that has a distinctive second to it. So that's gonna be, it has a minor second. That's the distinctive interval, which changes it from shape number one to what I would call shape number four, which you might call the Phrygian shape if you started here, or the second note Lydian shape if you started from the second note because the same shape is the main shape for both the major and minor form, which is often the case when you see a shape that has a starting point of these two half step apart shape. And from a caged system, the related major is F. So if I saw that F and I made a lean back chord, it would be like a C shape there, so you might still once again call this a C shape, even though it's shifted up a little bit different. We saw shape number four back here shifted to the back. Now it's another shape number four, but it's shifted kind of up. And so then we're gonna say, if I played that out, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so if I look at the intervals, we have a distinctive one note away, minor second. And then we have a three note away minor third, as per usual, which would be out here. And then we've got a, a five note away perfect fourth. We've got a seven note away perfect fifth. We've got a eight note away minor six. We've got a 10 note away minor seven. And then back home to the octave. So the distinctive note once again would be here. So if I didn't play either of those two, then I wouldn't know if it's minor or Going to 
minor. Stop it there.